Most of you guys know when you purchase an aftermarket air filter, which a lot of you guys already have on your diesel trucks, they come pre-oiled. And then of course, some guys like the dry air filters, which I'm more of a dry air filter kind of guy. Will the oily air filters actually destroy your engine or cause any damage? So we're gonna answer that here in this video today. I'm gonna go ahead and make the long road trip to HSP Diesel put in another order for the wife max because we're missing parts we need more parts which stay tuned for that i got so much cool content coming your guys's way that's why i've been absent from youtube but stay tuned for that seriously but since i'm going to be at their shop i asked them if i can make a full shop tour in the same video as well so we're going to do a full circle and talk about how they make the parts in production it's going to be kind of neat to be able to take you through the whole shop and show you start to finish from raw parts to the end product and i know a lot of you guys watch this channel and see me building these trucks and seeing all the parts that i use most of them do come from them like all the piping the valve covers the traction bars but more importantly let's talk about these aftermarket air filters and what's better seriously let's talk about it so I'm getting this question a lot and as a matter of fact I'm questioning myself because I have no idea but we have the experts here man I'm here at HSP diesel and we're gonna talk about dry air filters or oiled air filters which is better and I want to get your guys's take on this too because I know a lot of you guys are out there in the real world and actually using these uh, air filters aftermarket oil dried whatever what do you swear by I'd love to read it and what do you think what's the best so let's talk Joe I think you were asking me do do I prefer oil or dry yeah. and I was like oil because I don't want to gunk up my mass airflow sensor yes he said oh I need a dry one because I don't want to have mass airflow issues and I said it all pertains to how much oil you're putting on the filter I mean realistically they're going to flow very very similar right there's not a huge difference in the overall overall performance um, but the big advantages to the oil filters is just the fact that it will you'll see continued performance a little bit longer the the way the pleating is put together the way the mesh is put together in the filter the the it's this dry is basically a paper filter and so you can't uh you can only get those papers so close and so um i guess fine uh, before you can't stop any other other small medium dust so they have to keep these really tight so they plug up faster than they would uh, with an oiled filter where these obviously are cleanable so you can wash them out refill or re-oil it and you're back on the road going where you'd have to actually replace these because they're not washable uh, just the way the media is constructed you, you can't get the longevity out of the dry filter as you can the uh the oiled because it's oiled so obviously it's, it has life to it it's not like like well, you it's, said it's paper exactly it's using the the to me the the mesh the actual like the media itself is a little bit larger openings right where you're using the oil to help catch the debris and everything all through these pleatings right so depending how tight each one of these pleat packs are and the depth of the pleat itself is going to help you know you know the longevity of you know how the life that you're going to get out of the filter it almost makes the dry filter disposable would you say it is disposable 100 yeah. percent. i mean you're you're gonna i mean depending on how much you drive right some guys are on dirt roads i mean my family farms i'm always on dirt roads up here in michigan so my filters just get just trashed so we end up just pretty much every oil change i'm almost changing it just because of how much dirt and dust and debris we get in them every oil change uh, that's there's you know, nothing wrong with that yeah at all. some guys will say it's extreme but with the cost of what these things are i mean they're not expensive 65 on a replacement filter. 65 for the replacements but you look at how much a turbo is and you go and look at the blades of that turbo and you'll start to see a bunch of debris and and chips and and whatnot on there and you really start to realize man i'd much rather spend 65 bucks for a filter versus a new turbo so you're saying an oil filter because I'm a dry filter kind of guy, is better than a dry filter. I it is very truck specific, right? So if again, where if you I'm live, somebody, what you're doing, well, like yeah. you said, you're on a farm. Yep. If so, if you're somebody who likes to tinker, right? You like to make sure you're always, you know, knowing exactly why you're doing what you're doing, and you like to oil the truck. You do your own oil changes. You know, you do your own brake changes and maintenance. You're probably going to be more typical to be an oil filtered guy where somebody else does your oil changes and, and you don't really care about that. You're just in it to drive it and get the job done. You might want to go to a dry filter and have one on hand so you can change it easy. I mean, obviously there are issues with oiled filters if you know you start over oiling it with your mass airflow and whatnot. But again, proper oil and proper routine maintenance. I mean, there, it will outperform a dry filter in, in the longevity of the life of it. Basically the filter is gonna sit right here and when it's sucking the air in, it's gonna have to go past this mass airflow sensor, which essentially is just telling the computer air to fuel, you know, how it's gonna run this and that, but it's a very important sensor that the engine has. Uh, but what I was talking about was if it's oily, now you've really changed my mind on this actually, cause <laughs> I didn't really think about it. But when this filter is oily for my thinking you know just me thinking which isn't always a good thing uh, when it's sucking in when the air is coming through it's gonna take some of that oil yep and then bring it into that 
sensor which would sit in this port right here and it's just basically a little you know, see a little spring you know it's a little electronics and stuff like that but uh, it once it once that little bit right there of the electronics gets a little oily it will send some weird readings to the engine maybe throw a engine light and then you're like what the heck's going on and then you think it's something else and you're all over the engine I'm right. going on a rabbit trail again but in, in reality <laughs> I mean oil if this is over oiled you're essentially having to suck the oil through air is not going to penetrate through the oil if it's not thin enough right you need you need the air to go through the media without having an oil layer on it because obviously the air is not going to suck through so if you're over oiling it you're actually probably increasing restriction over anything because the air just can't simply pass through the media so and then when it does pass through the media because obviously this thing is going to pull a lot of air through that's when you start to get oil contamination in your in your mass airflow and in the tube and everything else makes perfect sense yep. Guys, let me know in the comments. Again, let me know what your thoughts are on. This is a hot topic, and it's really cool to hear it from the experts. Let's talk about that mesh really quick. So you run a mesh on your LB7. I do. Uh, I live on a dirt road. I like going to the sand dunes, you know, so the real dusty, sandy environments. Um, I like running the pre-filter because it'll keep my filter cleaner longer. Uh, it even has some water repelling ability. By no means is it waterproof. Um, so you don't want to submerge yeah. Yeah, it. Don't I, wanna, you don't want to go I've, for a drink. I've been there, ask my friends. But, uh, <laughs> but it's nice. So if it gets a little wet outside, the winter months that we see, any splash that could get on the media is going to really bead right off of this. So um, not something I would say, if you're going to the racetrack, we'd probably want to pull the, this, uh, this filter right. mesh. Um, but on day-to-day -day driving, uh, I really like it just because yeah. the big bugs, all that other nonsense, it stays out of the filter. For, for you dry filter media guys, that will help the longevity of the dry filter, right? You're just stopping the big heavy contaminants and debris from going in all of those tight pleat packs and it'll help that dry filter last longer without, you know, having to issues of changing all the time. That's a good point. So if mm -hmm. you're a dry filter guy, this is definitely going to be yes, your... Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I know I was asking you this before, but would you see a decrease a little bit on MPG? Because, I mean, it, I understand it's very fine and all that, but would it... Would I it think it's so... It's so... I mean, even the even the, the pores or what you want to say on that are so much less restricting than even the filter would be. I don't think you'll see any, you any issues any with miles per gallon or, or restriction or anything like that. And yeah, it's, it would not be an issue. And you haven't seen anything on your truck, huh? I haven't. Much like the filters, every oil change, check them. You know, check the sock, check mm -hmm. the filters, clean them. You know, some guys are every other, some guys like Joe are every oil change. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. very, very situational per truck, per person. Um, but that's the stuff that I feel like is going to give you that performance mm -hmm. loss. You know, a dirty filter, a dirty sock cottonwood season for us really oh yeah absolutely. Um, you know this thing will get covered real quick but on that subject i can rip this thing off rinse it it's dry in less than an hour mm -hmm. you know back on the truck and we're on the road mm -hmm. one more thing i wanted to ask you guys about since i have you here this is awesome um what is the proper way to clean these hsp air filters? Well, really any, any air filter in general but these aftermarket air filters um the way they're designed you can't just take a power washer to that can you no definitely not i mean there there's a there's a metal screening that holds the pleat packs all together Obviously, if you have a dry one, the way to clean it is throw it in the trash and get a new one. That would be my suggestion. Um, I always wash from the inside out as much as you can. Um, obviously, all of the air, all the contaminants are trying to make its way through this way. If I could pull the pleat packs apart, you can see all the debris and the junk that's actually inside that pleat pack, right? So all that surface area I'm trying to gain by having these pleat packs, that's actually why they make that zigzag pattern. I could take the same media and make one circle around, but I mean, if I unfolded that, it would only be, you know, two feet of media that I would able to be able surface area that I could pull through. If I unfold this entire thing with all of those uh, ripples in it, I mean, you're six foot of filter media now able to go through here, so your restrictions at less, but it's very easy to not realize how much junk is caught down in the middle of all of those pleat packs. Mm -hmm. um, and by the only way to get it out is to push it from the inside out. So in, in light air? Light air, uh, with these, with the washable, you could literally put it right in your sink. And as long as the wife doesn't catch you, <laughs> wash your filter in her sink. I've done it, that before. Yeah, it'll go right down the sink. <laughs> but uh, definitely be careful with the pressure washer. We don't want to hurt. You start damaging the this fine mesh on the outside and the, and the media filter itself. You'll you're start, just sucking in dirt yeah, it's, at it's, that it's, point. Yeah, exactly. You'll, you're blowing you're, holes right through it. For sure. But it looks like you guys have an updated version. I mean, with the majority of the intakes that we're building now, they all have somewhat of a rectangular or square pocket to fit it in. And so traditionally, everybody ran a round filter. One, manufacturing wise, it's easy to manufacture the round. It's just, it's a common standard easy thing. But 
we wanted a little bit more. We have a, a really, really close connection that has the ability now to make their own pleat packs and we actually machined and, and built all of our own molds here at the shop. And so now with the cat, that combination, we got to come up with our own, uh, with our own filter. I mean, the transitions on the inside are, are nice and smooth. Um, I mean, we just try to make it look as good as possible. And then with this, we were able to gain a lot of surface area by going to the shape, um, just because it fits really well into our engine bays. and. And we don't gain anything but increased power and flow and longevity out of the filter. So they've been working really, really good. And I think on the flow bench, we saw right around 10% increase in flow. Um, but I think it also contributed to the longevity on them. They're, they're nice filters. And speaking about filters, I remember I came here a couple of years ago. We did a YouTube video uh, with the dyno. We had an L5P and there was no tuning involved. There was no magic tricks here. All I did is, uh, all we did is we simply just installed an HSP yep. intake and we gained, an inc we increased our horsepower and our torque. Yeah. Yeah. It's very impressive because in order just to drive it and you know it's funny when i put an intake on my truck and i get on it you can hear it it's throating yes. it sounds good yep. and believe it or not it actually does make it a little faster mm -hmm. but to put it on a dyno to see that firsthand that was really cool yeah. all we're doing by making the restriction less is moving that horsepower curve forward right when we're driving and pulling a heavy low you guys know at 2000 rpms is where we need that power well, if it's real restrictive, a lot of times that char the charger, everything has to build enough boost where it's already so late in the power band that we're just not using it. So we pull that whole thing forward by you know lessening the restriction and opening everything up and you feel it in your seat when you're driving it drastically. It's pretty awesome. So it's kind of interesting when I was coming into your shop, Joe, I noticed this thing right here. That looks like something out of a pole truck or a dragster <laughs> or something. That's pretty cool. Yeah. What does that go on? Uh, well, I don't know if a lot of people know yet, we're known as like the Duramax guys, but we are, uh, we are venturing into a uh, territory with the Ford guys now. So my, uh, the my dark side, yeah, the dark side, right? <laughs> my, uh, my dad, my family has always had Fords, so they always give me a lot of, a lot of crap about not building anything for them. So I said, you know what, <laughs> we're, we're going to make it happen. So we, we, uh, we got a, anything from 17 to 19 and then, uh, the 20, 20s and up uh, we're, we're in development and just finalizing a lot of the intakes and intercooler tubing and all of that stuff for the Ford stuff so we're there to help you guys out too we're not all Duramax now. so you have a pro you have a truck you have a Ford yep. ready to go yeah we have we have a actually my uh, my dad's truck that is now my sister's truck we had about 10,000 miles or so on the whole setup and everything's been working fantastic so I got to see how this looks in the engine bay this yeah. is pretty cool you man. need to do a poll what in, well for your channel what looks better, the Ford engine bay or the Duramax oh. engine bay? For yours, it's pretty clear to see which would win, right? Well, I don't know. It's up for debate. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> That's pretty, but those six sevens are monsters. Yeah, they are. It's I've got to say. It is a fantastic truck. It runs really good. And they're good. beautiful looking yeah, trucks, they too. are cool. Yeah, yeah, we can head out and I'll show you the one in the truck if you want. Anything from the intake, I just, I like everything to look, to look very factory. We all know that there was definitely issues in the changing years between moving the battery to the front, to the back. Um, we, we did what we thought was right by moving the, fil the filter and everything back forward in the, uh, I want to say it's the 20s. 17 and 19s. 17 and 19s, yep. So we, 17 and 19s actually have the filter here, um, and we have a tray that moves it, uh, the battery back. And then the hot side and cold side, very similar to the Duramax, but obviously looks drastically different, and but definitely cleans the engine bay up. You guys obviously got this going on too. You guys have mm -hmm. a cold side and a, what is that, a yep, hot side? Yep, the hot side and cold side. Obviously it has the water to air intercooler instead of the traditional air to air. So we did the hot and cold side just to help feed those. I mean, those from the factory, they're only like two and a quarter inches. They're really, really restricted. And you, we saw it on the engine dyno or uh, on the dyno itself. And I can even give you some of that info so you can post it up for your, your, your channel there. It's pretty amazing how much of a difference it made. It's pretty cool. Would I ditch the Denali and go uh, six, seven power? <laughs> Hey. <laughs> Does he look as good driving it? That's the question. Well, I don't look good anyways, <laughs> but it's been a while since I've been back. Lots of change. It looks like you guys got a lot more uh, CNC machines going on. Yeah. No, we've been busy growing all the time, right? So trying to keep up with customer demand on products and parts. Um, everybody knows the supply chain issues right now are really, really challenging. So the only way we can combat that is just bringing it all in house and letting us control everything. I mean, there's some stuff that's always out of our hands, like material and whatnot, but yeah, we've been growing with the machines and, uh, and everything, just trying to make everything faster and smoother and better for, for the end user, you guys. So check it out. We'll see what's, uh, what's running right now. LML bridges, obviously you can see this is a <laughs> non-milled LML bridge. And when it's done, this is your final piece. It's pretty, uh, 
pretty cool looking. It's almost like jewelry to me when it comes off of there. It's so shiny and bright. It looks awesome. I can only imagine how many shavings you guys go through. That's a lot of material. To, yeah. That is heavy. You guys that are hearing yeah. this right now, uh, in the comments, I know some of you guys are going to say that you're going to hear some of the humming going on in the video, but that's what's going on. The CNC machines are going. You guys have commented before when I was at Ryan. So that's, but that's, that's pretty awesome, Joe. That's cool, man. Yeah, it's neat. It really is cool to see it change like that. Yeah, we've been doing mostly all, all of our stuff, HSP stuff, is all the parts we normally run, but we do do some outside machining and then some prototyping for others, and this is actually one of the parts we're prototyping now and, and doing some development in for some bolts. You guys probably, uh, if you guys really know what you're, what you're looking at, you might be able to know what that part is. All wrong answers are correct, guys. Let me know in the comments. What do you guys think it'll be? So this is like an exclusive, no one knows. No one knows yet. Oh, okay. Soon, soon everybody will start to see those things. Can, is it something that involves go fast? It's go fast parts. Oh, okay, okay. Fast parts, yeah. Let me know, guys. What do you think that is? I have no idea. So last time I was here, you guys had the hoist and the service and all that. Yep. So. Yeah, we're all, we, we pretty much have converted over to all manufacturing. Um, the service side of the stuff was harder. We just, we were so busy with manufacturing, keeping up with product demand that we just didn't, we, one, we didn't have the space for the service. And uh, my background is more the manufacturing and design and stuff. So it was easier for us to just push all towards manufacturing and then let some of the uh, some of the locals and, and all of our dealers and everything, we just try to support them as much as we can for the, for the parts, so. So the question here, do you have enough space? No, we do not have enough space. 20,000 square feet and I thought that was plenty big. And I know you've had issues with your barn. Yes. Just like anything else, build it bigger. If you're gonna build a building, you're gonna build a barn, I swear, you will run out of space so fast, it's unbelievable. Yeah, you just buy more stuff. Yeah, exactly, it just more, keeps more filling space. up. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah I feel like a hoarder at times and then I think, but everything in here is used, like we use all of it. So it's not like it's waste, it's just, it's just how it is. See over here, I mean, there's, every day we have, these couple hoppers fill up and then we'll, we'll replace it. We have a full, I don't know how many cubic yards, we have a full dumpster that is dumped that we uh, dump everything into every day. I would never swim in that. Or latest employee. Oh, this is the... Do you have a name for her? We haven't named it yet. We got to figure it out. It's it's not running at the moment, but man, it is fantastic. We have some cool video clips we can we can send you that you can post up for, for your guys to see, but it's, it's really neat. It's just so consistent. It never stops. It always is automated. It runs really, really smooth. And what does it do? Cool. Opens the door, grabs the part out, sets the part on the table. Once the grabs a new raw block, comes in, sets it in, shuts the door and then sets and runs the machine and then it just cycles all day long. And it doesn't talk back and it's always on time. <laughs> exactly. Got it. Our biggest hurdles, obviously everybody knows we do a ton of tubes. Um, and so trying to get all of our tubing from other suppliers was very difficult, especially with all of the bends that we do. Um, so we said, you know what, let's just bring it in house. And it's a challenging, uh, it was an eye opener a little bit on how challenging the bending was because it's a lot more of a finesse than it is just a brute get it done. Um, and so come on, check them out. I'll show you the benders are pretty neat. So we can do anything down to one inch, mandrel bends, uh, a 1D bend, and all the way up to six inch. So our dies and everything we have right now, we go up to five. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, going from pretty much having everything designed from us, but then going to a facility that would bend them for us, and we just got you know pre-bent lengths. Going from now starting with straight tubes to a final product, it's really neat. It's almost a little satisfying just for us. I mean, there's a you don't realize the challenges until you get into it. And then, you know, the accomplishment that the guys and, and everybody that we have working here can see a product go from literally a straight piece of material to it all bent and done and fitting in a truck is really, really cool. Well, this one's gonna tackle basically our charge tubes. So three inch and under. Um, and then that one over there is the intake tubes, uh, which ours are four and a half inch. Okay, so, so a lot bigger. Man, it's incredible how much bigger of a machine you're gonna need just to gain that extra, what, inch or two? It's a big girl. This one, with the size of it, it can do a lot tighter. Well, all of our bends are really tight tolerance. Keeping up with production, you know, keeping up with demand, maintaining this in-house. So obviously this is just, you know, one example, but this will soon be a finished HSB hot set. It's basically kind of where it starts, right? We have the raw block coming in material. We have raw material coming into the fab and prep area. If you actually turn around, you can see that like, those are all pre-cut tubes ready to cut to length. And they're going through prep to make sure they're all deburred and cleaned and ready to go. And then they go to the bending department. Obviously, once they're bent, this is the wash station. If you look right there. There's a, a so those are your hot tanks? Yep, dirty rinse. Wow. It goes through dirty rinse. They'll be pulled out and go to the clean rinse. 
and then they're basically prepped and ready for welding then. So if you turn here, you can see all of this stuff is kind of prepped and ready for welding. And then we normally have like a traveler that tells the guys, hey, this is a job you're working on. Um, how, what's the total quantity, when it's expected to be completed and all that stuff. A lot of care and a lot of effort on each part. It's not like it was just like machined yeah. with robots and yeah. stuff. I mean, that's kind of our main thing when we talk to all the guys is like, even though they're doing 100 or 150 of a part, each individual part goes in an individual customer that has to be satisfied with that individual part, right? So it's just because you do 100 of them doesn't mean eh, 98 of them are really good. No, like 100 of them need to be perfect, you know, so to make sure that every customer is satisfied. It's it's a challenge, but we're trying to make it work. Finished inventory stuff. That's getting ready for big for orders and orders going out. Nice. And then once they get picked, they pretty much go on a rack. Uh, all the orders are pretty much stacked in you know, the specific color that they're gonna be on. And then they'll get sorted and matched up uh, once they go through blasting and powder coat. This, okay. uh, this oven, what, was the, what is the coolest thing you've ever baked in here? Other than metal. Cookies. <laughs> Baking a pizza in here, would you eat pizza after they just powder coated? <laughs> Let me know in the comments. I would, I'd try it. We try it. I'm sure, I'd eat, I'm sure I've eaten plenty of powder coat. I'm sure we've done worse. <laughs> So obviously, all the all, once it's all pretty and fancy, it comes out of powder coat. It gets wrapped and checked for, you know, inspected and checked for blemishes and everything. And then this is pretty much where we kit everything and uh, sort it, get it put back in the orders. And as the orders are get stacked, the guys will go through, double check it, scan it on inventory, and gets packed and boxed and gets set over there, ready to go to whoever's door. It's, it's grown exponentially, and with that, it's hard because I find a balance of like I've always liked like the real like family oriented shop and you know we're not too overly tight with everything but at the same time when you're pushing this much stuff out and we have that many great customers like it's hard not to make sure everything is perfect right so we have to update our software we have to automate processes i mean mike has like a crazy amount of people calling him every day oh, yeah. and, and if we don't keep it straight out here it's really really puts him in a bad place so it's cool to see everything grow and the team that we have is fantastic like they're they're really really good good bunch of people and keep growing and sending the orders out. So I'm gonna go ahead and head to the house and we're gonna go ahead and rip off that dirty air intake mm -hmm. and put it on the new one, the new and improved one. But guys, thank you so much for everything. This is this is really, this is a treat, like I said, to be able to see how right. this process works out. Because honestly, from the outside looking in, just the consumer, right. a guy that just buys these parts, right. it doesn't seem as complicated. But when you actually see the, the whole like, Wow, yeah. like that machine, that was insane. Yeah, it is cool. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's odd for me, it doesn't ever seem that complicated until we walk through and you guys, and then I start thinking like, wow, there's a lot of moving pieces here. <laughs> Definitely. So it's fun, it is fun. All right, so here is the old one and this is the new one. We're gonna go ahead and put this in right now. A lot more volume, let's see how it fits. That actually fits pretty good. I'm gonna put the lid back on and we should be good to go. The filter in this truck was nasty. I'm really glad I was able to replace that. But guys, that is it for this video today. I need you to stay tuned. I'm serious about this. We got a lot in the works, especially for the Wife Max. We have to rebuild that transmission. We're gonna be headed to Wisconsin. Kodiak truck. So we're gonna do a full Garen built transmission and we are not cutting any corners. And then of course, also for some of you guys that are interested in any of these parts that we were talking about in the channel, I'm gonna leave all of the web links from hspdiesel.com in the description below as well as discount codes and stuff like that to take care of you guys but hey that is it for this video thank you so much for watching we'll see you on the next one stay tuned